met Dr. Tyrone Howard, who, for those in the room who know him, is very persuasive. And he said, you really should do work on African American women. I said, no, thank you. Um, and I kept on moving, and then I met with him again, and he was like, you know, you have such a beautiful story. You should really do work on African American women. And I said, no, no, thank you again. Um, and then I went to a conference, and the conference had nothing in terms of research on African-American women. So then I went up to him and I said, fine, you win. He said, I'm glad you see it my way because research is research and you should really do this work. And by the way, I want you to start this class for African-American women here at the university. Little did I know that that would lead me on this path. But it was happening all along, really. It was happening all along. I sat in Shabnam's class in Globalization and Women, and I was blown away by the things that women were experiencing across the world. I sat in Emma's class, and she said, you know what, do a social, this is a social movement class. Whatever the way the wind moves you, do a project based on that. I let myself find a project on women. And then I met Uma, and Uma was like, this is such important work. You should be doing this work on women because it's not talked about enough. And then I said, fine, this is my path, and I want to liberate others. So the purpose of the study, and I'm going to go through a couple of these slides pretty quickly, so don't feel like you have to read it all, um, because you won't be able to, be, unless you're a speed reader. But the purpose of the study is really to address the absence of research and literature practice around African American women at predominantly or historically white institutions. The reason for engaging in the study like this comes from my experiences as an African-American woman, a student affairs professional in the areas of parent programs, new student programs, and finally as an emerging scholar who has become painfully aware that there's little research in African-American women in their first year. The experience that women, of African-American women, they're layered, right? Because of the intersectionality of gender and class and race. And so they need to be separated from their male peers as we talk about who they are, what they need at predominantly white institutions. Here's the research question. I want to know, how do the participants' first year experiences in relation to family relationships, academic pursuits, and social engagement in college environments impact their ability to adjust to the collegiate environment? And then I had some questions. Here they are, you can read them for yourself, but I really want to talk about the spectrum of experiences. Not just one experience, not in a monolithic view, but the spectrum of experiences, and I think that these sub-questions really get at these, uh, the spectrum of experiences students may face around family, around their academic adjustment and preparation, and around their social involvement in that first year. Now I have to be honest with you. May of last year was probably one of the worst days of my life. I sat in this room, I sat in a room for the dissertation proposal, and I thought, okay, I think I have it, but I wasn't really in my gut sure that I had it all together. And these three lovely ladies <laughs> sat down and had a wonderful conversation with me, after which my car had been towed, Aww. after which I had keys that got lost. <laughs> and, you know, that was a really a turning moment for me. And I think if it hadn't happened that way, I really wouldn't have understood community cultural wealth. I really wouldn't have understood black feminist thought. And I really wouldn't have understood the model for identity development of black undergraduates. It was having that experience that really helped me understand that my mom's aspirations for me were important in me finishing this. It really helped me understand that my godmother, who's my other mother, and my aunts who were saying, you can do this. You know how to do this. You've been doing this. Where the black feminist thought. And the model of identity and development of black undergraduate women was something I was teaching every day. And so these frameworks really helped me and really shaped how I chose to reframe um, the dissertation. Now when I say reframe the dissertation, people in the room may say, what does that mean? It's the set of theories that you use to base your dissertation on, the research that you're going to do. And so I have just kind of, for those of you who are interested in theory, um, have the theories actually defined right here. A framework of communities of color in which a particular set of skills, knowledge, abilities are not viewed as valuable or normative to the dominant culture are seen as forms of wealth and can be obtained and shared within the communities. 
There's six types of these capital. Social, aspirational, navigational, cultural, and resistance are the forms of capital. And they're not tangible, but they are, right? They're not tangible, but they are. Black feminist thought is the intersection of, of oppression, which is based on race, gender, and class, is used as the foundation for the framework and focuses on redefining identity by and for African-American women. And I really want to focus on that by and for African-American women. I am helping to shape the next generation of African-American women through the sharing of my stories, through the sharing of my experiences. And then, um, again, at, the at a conference I went to, I found this model of identity development for undergraduate black females. And although I didn't use it as a framework, it really was a good foundation because it really talked about pre-collegiate socialization and the personal foundations that African American women have in order to help them uh, define what their college experience is going to look like. So no dissertation would be complete without literature, of course, because that's what I am creating, is more literature to base our research on. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the literature that I found and what it had to say around, God bless you, um, African-American women. Uh, and I will just start by saying, you know, there wasn't a whole lot. So I was piecemealing together information about African-American women. And so we started with family. And it said, regardless of ethnicity or race or class, folks need to feel a sense of community in order to survive on a college campus. That's just baseline. It's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You have to have that baseline before you can move forward. Um, but when it talked about African American women or women of color, it said they need to individuate themselves from their families in order to be successful in, the, in, in a predominantly white institution, which is counterintuitive to what Patricia Hill Collins says around black feminist thought and the need to engage with family in order to feel uh, helpful. And I think what's missing is this familial, the familial makeups, right? The research around what the familial makeups look like. Biracial students, students who are first generation African who are coming here from another country. Folks who have um, two same sex parents. So there is literature missing in terms of how that impacts um, the African American woman's uh, experience. The impact of K through 12 schooling for African American females can be traumatic. Um, and that was through and through in the literature. It can be traumatic because sometimes the way that African American women assert themselves or females assert themselves in K through 12 schooling can look um, like they're being too assertive or being aggressive. And so that was where the literature kind of was a rub for me, of course. But um, in reading studies by Dr. Jay Kumar um, and others, they talk about if a student is supported in K through 12 schooling, they feel like they're part of that community, which then makes them feel like they can be part of a college community. And so I think where we could still do more research in terms of the literature is really around thinking about the reform of K through 12 schooling and the changing landscape of suburban neighborhoods that include more first generation African American students, more first generation African students who need more research done around how you support them as they go into um, their educational, higher educational career. So next, methodology and data collection. This is where it gets fun. So if you were bored by the first part, <laughs> maybe you'll like <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, so narrative inquiry. I went around and around and around about what I wanted to use as my um, data collection and how I wanted to do my methodology. I was like, ooh, maybe I'll do it. Shama was like, that's good, but, and then I was like, ooh, I got it, I got it, and then I would tell myself, no, that absolutely won't work, um, and then uh, Shama came across narrative inquiry, and what, uh, and she talked about it, I remember being on the phone with her late one night, and we talked about it, and she was sending me like, sent me like five articles in five minutes, and I was like, okay, <laughs> it's a lot, um, but once I started to read, it was perfect, for what I wanted to do. It was perfect. And so, as you can see, it's um, on the screen. But I really want to talk about it from this perspective. I wanted to do narrative inquiries because I could use the autobiographies of the participants. I wanted to hear their voices. I didn't want my voice to override what their experience was. And I wanted to be able to talk about 
first year, the first year on a predominantly white campus. And because you have to use time, place, and manner in narrative inquiry, it was important. And I am a storyteller for anybody who knows me. I <laughs> love a good story. Um, and so I was, I, storytelling was in me. And so I never thought that a dissertation could really be a culmination of everything you've experienced and a culmination of everything you've done. So storytelling was important to me as well. So the data collection. How were the participants recruited? Well, I work at a university in Southern California, so I decided to use a university in Southern <laughs> California. Um, and I decided to call it West University because as part of um, the dissertation uh, protocol, you can't name the university for what you're using the research at. So I renamed it, but that's where I, the place I work is where I decided to use uh, the participants because it made it easy. Uh, how did I collect them? Well. I told you about Dr. Howard as I started, and I talked about how he was like, you could start a class. And so two of my colleagues and I um, started a class for first year African American women in the spring of 2014. I work with parents. That's my full time job. Um, and so it was really easy if I was trying to be strategic about this to use participants that I could get my hands on easily. So I sent out a um, Google form to all of the classes we had taught up until that point and ask them if they'd be willing to participate in the study. Um, originally, I got 15. And then I said, from that 15, I'll kind of narrow down based on who turns in their consent form. 11 turned in their consent form. One was a transfer student, so that would work for my study. So I said, thank you so much. I'll use you later. <laughs> um, and then, uh, again, I accepted consent forms. How was the data collected? I sent them a reflective essay prompt, and I asked them to share in three to four pages their first year experience. What did their first year look like? What was their family impact? What was the social uh, interactions? What were the uh, academic preparation? How did they feel academically in that first year? And then I had one-on-one -on -one interviews with them. Now, this was kind of tricky because I did the one-on-one -on -one interviews over the summer. So some of the one-on-one -on -one interviews were done via Skype, some of them were done over the phone, FaceTime, and call on another line because of technology. Um, and some were done uh, in person. And then I called Emma. And I said, Emma, I have all this great data. Um, but they're saying so many of the similar things. And I don't want to lose out on maybe if a student asks another student a question, because I'm a teacher at heart. right? <laughs> so I was like, I don't want to miss out on them learning, too. And she was like, yeah, you can do that. Made me think about this, and so this blue book which is where I took all my Emma notes. Um, and I decided to put together three focus groups. And it was so interesting to me that the three focus groups had a plaque, had a representative from each of the cohorts in the focus group. It was very interesting. And then how did I analyze the data? Well, some people say you should transcribe your own data. I don't believe in that. Um, <laughs> note binder of transcriptions that I uh, went through and had transcribed. And then I coded them using a software called Deduce, a uh, web-based software, and really put them into, chunked them into things, family, social interactions, academics. I mean, it was expansive. I actually was at my mother's house one day with highlighters and passing them out to people, like, would you like to code? <laughs> um, <laughs> anybody want to call? I think I carried around with me for like a week. I think I even asked my dad, like, dad, you want to code something? Um, nope. Uh, I think my brother took me up on the offer. Um, <laughs> go CJ. Um, and so then we got to the participants. And I want to introduce them to you. I'm not going to read each one of them to you because I can read them for yourselves. But what I want you to draw your attention to is that there are two that are from out of state. Um, and I also want you to draw your attention to what their parent, what their family makeup is. So we have Tonette, Layla, Sarah, Donna, Carmen, Aisa. <coughs> and then the last four, Jules, Angel, Sierra, and Janet. And as you can see, they all come from a variety of experiences. And what I thought was most interesting about their variety of experiences is that they were from first-generation African. 
right? So their parents had come over from Africa and they were first born here in America and what the implications of that were. There were low socioeconomic status, but it was really interesting to see how many students did not define them as low socioeconomic status or middle of the road and the variety of parents who were together, parents who were divorced, how many siblings was all interesting to me as I got to my five minutes. Um, and so that's where I want to spend most of the rest of my time is really with the findings and my recommendations as an emerging scholar. So I'll take I'll let you take a little time to read that as I take a drink of water. These are some of the quotes from the women around pre-collegiate socialization. And this is really where I spent my time really chunking the information around their find what they said was in these categories. So pre-collegiate socialization was the first category. I'm resisting the urge to have a call and response right now and the urge to ask questions. <laughs> um, uh, so the first piece was being Nigerian, right? So if you look at this first quote, it's around being Nigerian. And then the second quote is being raised in a high um, socioeconomic status environment. Um, the next quote is around family interactions in the first year. Having a father who is in jail and having coming from a structured home and having to navigate creating one's own structure. Again, if you're speed readers, you're getting through it. If you're not, I'm going to move on. Academic adjustment, K through 12 discrepancies, and being black while learning. And last but not least, social adjustment. Learning how to trust based on one's family interactions and race and its impact on relationships. So the discussion and recommendations. This is where I really enjoy talking about what I found and what, it, what its implications are for our future. So when we talk about family, <coughs> I decided to use that same frame that I did for the literature review because if you notice, K through 12 schooling gets moved out of there. So the impact that family has can be either positive or negative, right? And those students who had a positive experience had an easier time navigating through the university in the first year. Those whose parents were negative towards them, I'm thinking of one student who talked about her mom being her bully, had a hard, harder time navigating through the first year. Uh, the responsibility that these students felt for their families. So one student in Texas said, I used to go home at least twice a quarter because I felt like I needed to be home to help my mom. And then their interactions with their family members and the responsibility of being the smartest one. Uh, social adjustment. The K-12 socialization then impacted the way that they socialized themselves in the college environment. And then those intra, inter and intra <clears throat> dynamics, either being too white or too black to be in a certain state. So if they came from a suburban environment where they felt like they were um, around lots of white folks, and then they came to an uh, institution where they wanted to be around a lot of black folks, they were then say, oh, you're too white and you act too black. And so having to deal with those dynamics as they socially adjusted. And then living on campus, where they chose to live on campus really had an impact. The academic adjustment was the lack of diversity in the class. Students could feel really comfortable um, in their high school being around all white folks because those people had known them for 12 years. And then coming to a space where they were around white folks in a different way, around folks that were as smart as them, the lack of diversity then made them feel isolated from that space. The freedom to do their homework when they wanted to do it and not do it when they didn't want to really um, was an impactful piece of the academic adjust adjustment. And biggest was asking for help. Their ability to ask for help was really big. So here we go with why I think this is important and what the, what the implications can be for the future. What I noticed, and I want to use one student in particular to illustrate this point. One of the students that I uh, interviewed, Sierra, she came from a predominantly white institution, biracial family. She had a 5.0 her whole academic career, right? I know that's, they go up to, it's not 4.0, it's 5.0 now. Um, had a 5.0, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Had a 5.0 her whole academic career. Everyone knew her. 
Her family depended on her. She was really independent. And then when she got to college, everything kind of changed for her. She wanted to live around all African-American folks because she had never been able to do that before, and she did. But then what started to happen was she started to feel like she didn't want to tell her family that she was struggling because she had always been independent, always been a 5.0 student. Um, so she started to talk to her family less. And then she went into classrooms and she was noticing that people were making comments about, oh, you know, black folks are always late, or, you know, oh, I can't, are you an athlete? I, that's so interesting to me. And so where she once felt confident in the classroom, she began to isolate herself from being confident in the classroom. And then the new social norms on a, on a floor full of African-American folks who had a different set of social norms, a different way of talking, a different way of being than what she had been raised around, she then did, no longer felt comfortable even in the space where she was supposed to feel the most comfortable, which is at home. And that led to her isolating herself. Not in a way that she wasn't doing well in class, not in a way that her family thought something was wrong with her. It was really underneath the surface that the isolation was occurring. And when the isolation was occurring underneath the surface, that made her feel like it was a tilted or a crooked room for her. She couldn't see what was really happening. Um, and she couldn't, she couldn't identify it, so she was just surviving. She was just surviving on the college campus. She wasn't really thriving. And what I think the circle of adjustment needs to be is around feeling like family support, pre-collegiate socialization, Targeted programs and resources and intentional first year programming are all pieces of that adjustment. And I'll just touch on two pieces really quickly. Targeted programs and resources and intentional first year programming. I've said for a while now, and I've been doing this work for about 15 years now, that the adjustment of what we have, 1970s methods of impacting a, a new generation of students. And what I mean by that is first generation programming no longer really can exist when you have lots of African American families who've gone off to college. So the programs and resources need to change to fit the changing dynamic of students who are coming to these institutions. And what I mean by for intentional first year programming is the African American African American women in seminar class that we started to teach. And what we've noticed from that class is that we're giving them a toolbox a toolbox that they can use to navigate their way through the rest of the institution and the rest of the years. So it's not that they merely survive with that isolation in place, but it's that they thrive and they feel that family support. They feel like there's somewhere that they can go. They feel like there's somewhere that's home to them. And then when they, once they feel more confident, they can go across campus and do anything and make those networks and feel like, I know what I'm doing once I leave here, and I know that I deserve to be here, and there's someone who's been here before me, and someone that will come after me that I can support. And so I really think that to problematize the institution is really to say, we need to change the way that we think about African American women, <coughs> in particular, that they are, their stories are not monolithic, that their stories are really very, in a very layered and complex ways. And if we don't take the time to address that, we're running the risk of not having students who graduate, but then they're not thriving in their education and their experiences. And as alumni, they're not saying, yes, this is a university where I was able to thrive, even though it wasn't big for me. And even though they might not be thinking of me or taking care of me, or I might still feel oppression, I feel like I can thrive. I want to end with um, my final thoughts. The journey to complete this study was not an easy one, but it was all worth it. Never in a million years would I have thought I would be at an institution like West University, teaching first year African American while working with parents of, and families of undergraduates, but I couldn't be more grateful for the opportunity. The privilege of telling these women's story is something I will treasure for a lifetime, and I appreciate the opportunity to do so. In